Today on CityCast DC, Jordan Pascal has one of the most fun and probably one of the most stressful jobs in local DC media. He covers transport for WAMU. And anyone who lives here knows that if you want to get any two people in the region into an argument, all you have to do is bring up something involving traffic, metro, or one of the other subjects on his beat. Today, he is here to walk us through some of the big, big changes coming to local transit this fall. So listen along and prep for your next argument with a neighbor. Today is Tuesday, September 5th. I'm Michael Schaefer, and here's what DC is talking about. Hey, Jordan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. So DC has this weird situation with cars that it would like to tow, but can't. Can you explain what's going on and what may happen now? You know, it's a DC thing, but it's certainly, you know, kind of a nationwide thing right now where as you drive around, you probably notice this, that there is a lot of temporary tags or cardboard license plates that are saying, oh, I'm going to the DMV or, you know, just a lot of non-real license plates out there. And so what the DC council is trying to do is crack down on some of these long expired or counterfeit temp tags. And so council member Brianna Doe has introduced new legislation. It basically would allow the Department of Public Works to tow those vehicles and impound them immediately. Basically, they're saying that people are just blatantly kind of flouting the law and that that's not good for society. It's not good for catching people on these automatic traffic cameras. So basically, they're saying we're putting an end to this and we're going to do it by taking your vehicle. Wait, why is this happening more now? Was there like some pandemic backlog and license plate issuance or something? Well, yeah, I mean, that that was like a little bit part of it. It was, um, you know, like DMV was closed and they basically extended, um, you know, certain things to give people more time to renew and that sort of thing. But DMV gave people an inch and people took a mile where, you know, they just kind of let this continue. And people were way more in your face about how they were going about this, that in the past, you might be worried about police coming to ticket you or something like that. And people just say, all right, well, I'm going to do this as long as I can until uh, I get caught. And so they're going to have the consequences be a lot higher now. I feel sometimes like we're living in like real time social experiment or social science experiment <laughs> sure. where this is not like a crime of violence against others or something like that. But right. like there's this rule that maybe you think it's stupid, maybe you don't, but it's a rule that you have to have like a valid license plate on a car. Right. And it stopped being enforced for a while. And it has led to this change where a lot of people have sort of decided that permanently they're not going to follow it. Mm -hmm. And now the city or society more broadly is realizing the consequences of this. Like these people now also realize they can speed through a red light without having to worry about getting caught or whatever. Right. Is this a thing that's going to pass? And then... Is this a thing that's like just as easy to do as all that? That's a good question. I mean, there are a couple of people that have co-signed on this. It is a hot topic that a lot of people, uh, residents are frustrated and kind of sick and tired of seeing this stuff going on. Residents are frustrated because they just don't like the idea that their neighbor is getting away with something or be, or are they feeling like real consequences for this? Yeah, no, I think it's a little bit of the sense of them getting away with it, but more the fact that um, a lot of the times when you see bad behavior on the roads, it's usually a dark tinted car. They don't have the, the accurate license plate, that sort of thing. So I think they're basically saying, just just get bad drivers off the road. And it's easy to almost tell who the bad driver is when you have those like really obnoxiously fake tags. Like I just got a, a new car recently and I didn't want, I didn't want um, uh, my temp tag on there very long, you know, even though it looks like a newer car and stuff, I didn't want people to think, you know, like, oh, I'm screwing the lawn. So I went into the DMV pretty dang quick, actually, just because there, I think people with the temp tags have earned the reputation that it's bad driving. It's not a great reputation at the moment. Is there any data that you've come across that suggests whether, like, okay, if we accept that there's more people on the road that have, like, sketchy license plates that can't be enforced, has there been an uptick in, like, 
red light running or other sorts of traffic, dangerous traffic offenses? I haven't uh, seen anything uh, particularly correlated to this. I do know that the D.C. Police Department said, um, you know, a couple months ago at this point that they've arrested 1,200 people for having fake or expired licenses. So they are cracking down on it. But it would be interesting because I I do think that the temp tag is a pandemic, post-pandemic phenomena, at least anecdotally, that's what I've seen. I don't know what you think about that, but I think it's a, a, a more recent thing. Well, I bought a car during the pandemic, but I wanted to get the real tag on there as quick as possible, mostly just because I wanted to be able to park with zone parking. Right. But m- maybe that just means I'm too much of a dweeb who follows the rules. Yeah, maybe we're too much of rule followers. <laughs> All right. So meanwhile, for those people who are not uh, thinking about cars, we have a regional transit system called Metro. Mm. Perhaps you've heard of it. Yes. You cover it very closely. And there's a bunch of stuff happening. We've had a new uh, head of Metro for the last year. He gets a lot of attention. He's very telegenic. There's stuff happening on buses and trains. What do you like? What's big that we can look for from Metro for the rest of this year? Well, I mean, yeah, I, you know, Randy Clark is coming in the last year and he is making changes fast and fiercely. There's a lot going on in the next couple months. I mean, obviously, there's a huge financial deficit ahead or, or a gap, $750 million that they need to cover. They're doing a bunch of bus redesigns. They'll be rolling out kind of a final plan to revamp the bus network. There'll be 24-hour buses for the first time. Still, the D.C. Council still wants to do the free buses, so we'll be talking about that probably uh, starting next year. A couple of things I was interested in. The, so new, the new Metro bus design, um, in addition, I don't mean the routes, but I mean like literally the buses. Sure. Uh, you will now be able to enter via the back door yeah. and you can just tap your card on there. How is that going to work? Yeah. So, you know, it, right now there's two doors on most buses um, and the front can get really congested. If you've got, you know, a busy stop, you got five, ten people getting on. Some people will just kind of walk on past. But, you know, if people are doing cash or smart trip and it's not working, that bus has to wait there for all those people to pay and get on. But now with what's called backdoor boarding, they would put fair um, machines on both the front and back. So cutting that boarding time in half, you're getting that bus moving faster. So that's an improvement. They say, you know, there's a certain amount of things that cause bus delay. Traffic, obviously, one of them. The boarding process is is another big part of that. So they're trying to tackle that issue. Oh, so speaking of real time social science experiments, like what's their rough thinking about how many people will cheat? I mean, you, you go in the right. back door and you're supposed to tap your thing, but it's not like there's a driver who's sitting there staring at you and is going to kick you off the bus if you if you fail to do so. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that's definitely going to be part of it. It's kind of the trade off of do you get faster service for everyone and kind of deal with the people that don't want to play by the rules. Obviously, Metro is focused really intensely on fare evasion in their train stations. I, I imagine they'll have police on buses in the first you know, couple months to really monitor that stuff, but certainly a trade-off that they'll have to look at. And what's the, the rule? What are those police empowered to do? Like if, if I were to to get on the back door and not pay, mm-hmm. could they, what would they do? Ticket me, kick me off, arrest me? Yeah, it depends on, and and it's because our region's so complicated, it's, you know, different uh-huh. everywhere. Um, DC, they'll basically tell you to, to get off until, you know, you pay the ticket. And if you refuse to leave and you f- refuse to pay, they'll arrest you for trespassing. Other places, they can write criminal tickets for, for that. So, yeah, certainly consequences if, if the enforcement is there. All right, so speaking of, things that delay buses. There is something called bus lane ticketing. As I understand it, buses will now be equipped with cameras. So if you, driver, have decided to park in a bus lane, uh, thereby delaying the bus, they'll be able to capture your license plate, assuming you've got one, and you'll get a ticket. And the idea, I guess, is that it speeds up the bus? Think of it as like kind of a roving automated traffic enforcement camera. You know, like the, the red light ones are on traffic signals and the speed cameras are in specific ones, but these would be physically mounted in the windshield of a bus and yeah, do exactly what you said. I mean, if someone is idling in the bus lane or parked there, they'll capture that license plate number and they will send you out a ticket. Again, it relies on you having a accurate license plate. So, I mean, there's a lot of forces there that have to be in place. But basically, the idea of these bus lanes is that, you know, you can have 
25, 30, 40, 50 people on a bus, those people should have priority over those single car drivers. That's why these lanes are here to get those people to their destinations faster. But if somebody is being selfish and parking in the lane, the, you know, these are the new consequences, basically. How much of a problem is this? Like how, uh, it, <laughs> how, how, how often are buses delayed because some guy is, is in the bus lane? It's, it's often. It's often. I don't have exact numbers for D.C., but we should be able to get some good data um, from how many instances uh, um, happen. But, I mean, anecdotally, you see it pretty often. You also mentioned fare evasion. And so in metro rail stations, the idea has been they're going to introduce new fare gates that are tall and are not that easy to jump over. They've done so in some places, but I've also seen like videos on social media yeah. showing people jumping over them anyway. Are these things working? I think they're working to a point. Um, I think they're deterring um, the easiest uh, offenders. Because I mean, if you think about the current or old design with the paddles that are pretty low to the ground, pretty much anyone can take a, a, a tall step and be over those. People are still getting uh, around these new fare gates. They are taller. They're about five feet tall. They are plexiglass type shield things that kind of swing open like a saloon door kind of. But yeah, I mean, people are pushing through them. People are climbing up onto those actual kind of silver cabinets and then stepping over. But it's going to take a lot more effort and you're going to kind of look goofy when you're doing it as opposed to a very casual step over. You know, how effective it will be? Will it stop every single instance of fair vision? Probably not. Um, will it greatly reduce it? That's the hope. <laughs> I guess we'll find out the data in the, in the coming months. How do they decide where they're going to put them? I know they're rolling it out in different stations. What's the logic of which order it goes in? Well, yeah, eventually they'll be at all 98 stations, but the, they're doing 10 pilot locations or testing out things. Started at Fort Totten right now. Uh, Pentagon City is a recent installation. Um, there's, I think, three in Maryland, four in Virginia, three in D.C. They're kind of spread out. But mainly these initial stations, part of the design is that there's only one entrance to these stations. So it's a little bit easier to test it in a more controlled environment. So it'll be interesting. I mean, you know, it changed the, aesthet the aesthetics of the stations a little bit. I, I transfer at Fort Totten a lot, so I'll, I'll look at how people are using it and stuff. I've even, you know, tried it out myself and had a somebody tailgate behind me, you know, walk real close, which like, you know, if you're a personal space person, that's going to be upsetting. But you mean you've tried it out yourself like you've tried to jump it? No, no. Like I just tried the gates to see like how they operate and stuff. And a, you know, a young guy behind me, you know, I, I turn and look at him. I say, hey, not that I care, but they're just right up behind you to get in the, uh, you know, same opening that you are. Oh, so this this dude was trying to get in without paying and ride your wind. Just exactly. Fall right behind you. And, and I kind of look around and, and he says, just keep walking, bro. Don't mind me. You know, we might see a lot more of that type of stuff, too, where it's harder to jump over a five foot thing. You might have a lot more people kind of ride on your butt. All right. So Randy Clark, that's the new head of Metro. He said he was going to bring back automatic train operation, like the robots are driving the train. Yes. Well, what's the argument for doing that? And how's it going? Well, so Metro was built with this automatic train operation in mind. This was a new technology in the, the 70s. And basically, there are sensors in the tracks. It would know when to speed up, when to slow down, where to stop in the station. And you had an operator there to kind of mine that. Well, back in 2009, there was a, a deadly crash that killed nine people near Fort Totten. It wasn't the automatic train operation that was at fault in that crash. But because of the, we got to like, figure out what the heck happened thing. They turned that off. So um, it's been off for, you know, more than a decade, but Metro runs more smoothly, more efficiently. You don't have variance between drivers. Like, you know, you'll have some drivers that are, you know, real jerky on the, you know, coming into the station. You'll have some that are really great, but the automation really smooths out the experience for everybody. Doors would open immediately once it comes to a stop at the station. Right now, operators are looking at the window and checking and taking five seconds before they open the door. So they say that Metro will, will run better with the system. They've been testing these systems for about you know, a couple months over the summer. Mostly has gone well up until um, in August when the Metro Rail Safety Commission came out and said, we've observed some testing and we have concerns. Metro's not running this to like industry standards. They've seen trains 
go way above the speed that they're supposed to. They've seen trains not stop in stations and just speed at full speed right through. So wait, the, and these are we're talking about these driverless trains. There's still a driver in there, but it's on an automated system. So yeah, this is all testing done overnight. There's no passengers, that sort of thing. They're still working out the kinks, but Metro had hoped to get this system back in place by the end of the year. Now with this bump in the road, it's not immediately clear if that is still going to happen. Wait, so let me understand this. Uh, on automatic trains, there is still a driver. What is he or she doing? What they'll do is doors automatically open when they come into a station. The operator will stick their head out on the really busy days at rush hour. You've got tons of people going in. And so if it was automated, the doors would close on their own, but that would close the door on people. So mm -hmm. the operator still is responsible for closing the door, still responsible for responding to emergencies, responsible for responding to problems in the train, troubleshooting, that sort of thing. There is a future where there could be no operator, but that's going to be decades off. And if like in one of these situations that apparently happened during the testing, a train is blowing right through the station, and the operator is sitting there in the cab, what can that person do? Flip a switch and take over? Yeah, I mean, you can switch back into manual mode. The system shouldn't run that way. It should run as intended, but they didn't get super into the specifics of how this happened. And obviously they're still working through things. So, you know, I imagine it's the sort of thing that can get fixed, but yeah, I mean, uh, an operator can take over in, in an emergency or, or if something's wrong. The uh, automatic system is having some kinks. It's also not been a great uh, summer for the humans. The Post had a big report this summer about the Metro being accused of certifying unprepared train operators, et cetera. What was that story and what is going on in response to it? Yeah, training. I mean, that's been a big thing. And uh, again, it's a, a pandemic uh, effect where training wasn't happening as much with the health emergency and people not being able to gather and that sort of thing. And so basically what they did was kind of just waive the, the recertification for their operators. And this was also because there's staffing shortages and all this stuff and they need people to work. Well, for a few months that they just didn't recertify people, the Metro Rail Safety Commission found out and said, whoa, you got to not let these people operate trains until you get them retrained. And so there was some back and forth over like, did they actually get retrained, all that sort of stuff. This actually came up again during the Metro Rail Safety meeting where they found out that a operator had not fully completed his training, had started, was a couple weeks in, I think, and ran into a situation where there was a smoke in the tunnel and they moved the train backwards without permission. Not supposed to do that. But so they found out that the operator had failed a test and didn't retrain. They Metro retested him that same day and passed, but you don't want that to happen in the first place. No, I, I would imagine not. Yes. <laughs> Wait, in your job as a WAMU's transportation reporter, have you ever gotten to drive a Metro train? Okay, this is something I have wanted to do. I mean, not, you know, with passengers on it or anything. I mean, I would do it on my first day on the beat, just to be clear. <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. I don't know if they'll let you do that. <laughs> um, I hope not. They do have these training simulators that are relatively new, and it is incredible how um, how realistic it is. I mean, they've got screens all over. The video matches exactly what the lines look like, so operators get really familiar with specific things on a line. But no, I, I've long wanted to do the simulator, but have not had the chance to do it. Jordan Pascal, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Before you go, here is some quick news. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser is allegedly considering removing the certificate of occupancy from the storefront on Rhode Island Avenue Northeast that was formerly used by district dogs. Ten dogs died after the space flooded in August. Several of the dog parents met with Bowser last week and accused her of downplaying the delayed emergency response to the incident. Also, the Washington Commander's Stadium will be getting a $40 million upgrade, including a paint job, maintenance repairs, new ticket scanning pedestals, and new suites. And lastly, reports of financial exploitations of seniors and elder abuse are on the rise in the area, according to D.C.'s Attorney General. His office received 490 referrals for financial exploitation of elders this year. The Attorney General is targeting businesses that have a pattern of taking advantage of seniors. Thank you. 
And that's all for today here on CityCast DC. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with more news from around the city. Bye-bye.